Right. We'll have a, a look at uh, avian uh, imaging. Um, the first thing again, physical restraint. Um, these, there are these things that are produced, these Perspex restraint boards. Um, I mention them for completeness sake because you will see them if you, if you buy some of the uh, radiographic um, uh, exotic pet imaging textbooks. Um, I know they are much favoured in, in, in some parts of the world. Um, personally speaking, I'm not a fan of them. I don't think they're particularly uh, humane. Um, most birds will freak and if you've got a bird that's got something wrong with it in the first instance I think it will be um, uh, less than helpful to physically restrain it in what is effectively a stocks um, and then ties that can be then positioned to, to strap it down to a plate. So personally speaking I would always uh, anaesthetize a bird to radiograph it unless again all you're doing is like a swan you know you want to know if there's lead shot inside its gizzard so you just plonk the thing in a swan bag on the plate and take a shot because all you're wanting to do is uh, is there lead in it or is there not okay you're not too worried about positioning and the swan's already somewhat restrained anyway so I'm not a fan of these to, I have to say um, we mentioned obviously ISO and SIVO um, two views are recommended uh, clearly um, again we can do skyline views uh, ventrodorsal is typical right lateral you may want to do a left lateral as well uh, in some cases because it can can be useful the difficulty is getting the legs out of the way so they're not obscuring um, the uh, caudal salomic cavity you'll also note um, that in these instances um, you're actually taking the same view of the wings in both images okay so you're taking effectively um, a ventrodorsal or dorsoventral view of the wings in both if you want to get an anterior posterior view of the wings it's incredibly difficult to do without actually physically holding the bird you know pretty much uh, upright or upside down across a plate and then firing a beam um, which obviously for health and safety reasons I can't recommend that you do um, so but there is pretty much no other way of being able to do it to be brutally honest um, to be fair you can usually work out what's going on with the wing it being fairly thin um, from one view but it does make life a little bit more tricky um, I just wanted to put this up to give you a bit of an idea as to the sort of variations that one can see um, particularly in the skull of birds there's there's I mean, a lot of variation throughout the whole body form in birds but with the skull more than anything else, there is a lot of species variation. We have passerines, we have ratites, we have citocines, um, we have um, uh, more citocines, sorry, we don't have citocines, we have citocines, we have um, uh, vultures, we have duck, uh, waterfowl over here. Um, so the typical sort of raptor, a vulturine type beak, we've got obviously a recurved bill. We can see there's a difference between um, the uh, bone underlying um, the uh, upper beak and the, um, uh, the, the rhinotheca, the actual outer covering, the horn that's over the top of it. Um, we can also see how large the orbit of the eye is and we can also get an impression there of the scleral ossicles. Um, these um, are just about visible around here on the eye here, much more difficult to see on the passerine because it's quite small. The duck you can see it just in here. Um, the cytosine, we can just see it in here. So these scleral ossicles are around the scleral um, corneal junction. The avian eye is quite large um, and in cross section. Um, the bit that actually sits in the globe is kind of this sort of shape. So the socket is like that. Um, and effectively the scleral ossicles sit around this sort of junction here in a ring to support the front part of the eye. They're very faint, they are cartilaginous and they're a series of plates to a ring, um, but they're a normal feature. Um, we can see that the cervical vertebrae are fairly basic and box-like, but maybe slightly more elongated in the longer neck breeds. And there will be variable numbers. We can have you know, significant increased numbers of uh, cervical vertebrae uh, in long necked breeds, species. Um, in the case of all species, they tend to have relatively small um, uh, auditory bully, but some of them, particularly um, the birds of prey, um, tend to have slightly larger auditory bully, so uh, hearing is, is a better sense as far as they're concerned. 
Um, in the case of the tassiforms, we have um, a kinetic hinge joint um, at the top of the, the beak um, and the upper bill, um, which is a synovial joint. So there's an elastic um, bit of um, uh, pliable bone over the top here, and there is actually a little synovial joint at the junction uh, between um, the upper bill and the skull, which allows the um, a parrot to create the sort of crushing forces uh, that we know. Um, when you open the beak up, um, there is a series of complex um, uh, bone movements that result in the upper beak also being elevated. So you pull the lower beak down, the upper beak also comes up. And this is associated with the movements um, around the temporomandibular joint uh, with the quadrate bones, the jugal arch, which runs underneath here, and the palatine bones. Um, and these bones are typically the ones that we want to look at in window strike cases where there are potentially uh, uh, skew with beaks in parrots because it's often these bones that become damaged when a bird flies into a car or flies into a, to a window and they break and then they, when they fix they fix really well but often they fix on one side with an overriding riding bone and therefore shorter and then the beak starts to deviate off to one side as effectively uh, the beak is the whole upper bill has been pulled uh, to one side so we're looking in this area in here uh, at these bones for evidence of uh, foreshortening uh, or evidence of callus formation. To be fair, in a lot of cases, uh, we're not going to do any sort of surgical repair in this case, but there are obviously uh, external beak adapters that I'm sure um, uh, Neil will talk to you about um, that you can put on them um, to try and, a little bit like braces on teeth, that you can try and tension uh, band these things back. In the case of a lot of waterfowl, you can see the serrations to the beak. They also have this thing called a nail at the end, which is a sensory plug right at the end of the beak, which is a little thickening, which is a normal feature. Um, and um, we can see the, the trachea in all of these cases and just how um, wide the trachea is in comparison um, to the size of the bird. So actually, again, just demonstrating birds are relatively easy to intubate because they have a significant uh, a size or diameter trachea uh, in relation to, to body size, unlike uh, mammals. So a lot of species variation. Um, Cetaciform so um, body forms, just to give you uh, an overview of relatively normal body forms. Um, so we've got the ventral dorsal, the lateral, we've got a lateral limb. Um, and starting from the top to the bottom, first thing to notice on the skeleton, we've got pneumonized uh, humeri. In a lot of cytosines, actually, um, the femurs are not pneumonized or are lightly pneumonized at the top end, but actually we still generally, as a rough rule of thumb, say don't use the femurs for intraosseous catheterization because in the vast majority of birds they are pneumonized. It's also difficult to put a catheter in that area. Uh, we're generally uh, looking to put it into the ulna bone, which is the larger bone of the two uh, in the distal wing. Um, so avoid the humeri. Coming down to the shoulder joint, what we've got is two coracoid bones. So these are bones peculiar to birds and reptiles, um, and they act as a strut or buttress for the shoulder joint onto um, the keel. So we can see them in the lateral view here, down onto the uh, keel itself. Um, fractures in this area are common again in birds that are involved in uh, uh, road traffic accidents or fly into windows. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether you should or should not fix them. Some people feel, feel that firmly you should fix them. Uh, I am generally of the opinion that you shouldn't bother. Uh, it takes quite a lot of effort to get down to them. You have to cut through the pectoral muscles. They generally heal just fine uh, with cage rest and most birds fly perfectly adequately afterwards. But that is a matter of personal opinion uh, for some vets, some avian vets. So um, you will get varying views on that one. Um, however, coracoid bones, stout, supporting the um, shoulder joint. The scapula actually is this, these little tiny spicules of bone here, which you can probably just see here and here. So it's a fairly insignificant bone, but also articulates the shoulder joint. And then um, another bone articulates in that area, which is uh, the furcular or the wishbone, which is just up the top here, um, which is fairly small in parrots. It can be quite stout in strong flying, long distance, 
uh, species like a lot of duck and things like that can be quite a solid bone in that area and that provides a bit of spring to the whole sort of pectoral area uh, for the recoil uh, of the muscles. Um, the pectoral muscle mass as you can see lies in this area here but we can also see that there are darker areas, radiolucent areas inside the pectoral mass. Difficult to see on the lateral view but more obvious um, on the ventrodorsal. These are outpouchings of uh, air sacs and um, uh, air canals connected to the airways. So this is between the deep and the superficial pectoral muscles. They're connected as you can see to the humerus and so actually this area in here is effectively connected to the airways. The keel bone, if we want to get a rough idea as to positioning, we want to look at um, how square on it is. We want to try and get the keel bone overlying the backbone, so we've got it fairly square on. We've got the legs a little bit too far over really, you really want the legs further back, so it's not great positioning on the lateral view. Um, if we come down, we've got ribs obviously. We've got the heart shadow at the top here, and in cytosines we get this typical hourglass shape. So heart shadow at the top, two liver shadows at the bottom. On the lateral view, this is the heart shadow here, and we can see the aortic outflow, we can see the pulmonary return, we can see the pulmonary outflow, um, and then the liver is actually pretty much obscured in this area down in this area here. Um, the True acid secreting stomach, the proventricular, sits slightly to the left side. It's in this area here, overlain by part of the liver. On the lateral view, it's in this area here. Um, then we've got the gizzard or the ventriculus, the grinding stomach, which is well developed in cytosines and galliforms, poorly developed in carnivores. This one's got grit in it, so you can obviously very, very clearly see it sitting down in here. And then the intestinal mass is in this area here, in this area here the cloaca and the vent out the back here. Um, this dark area in here and these dark areas in here are the air sacs. So these are the um, uh, very thin walled um, receptacles that allow air to move backwards and forwards through the lung field. The lung field is actually in this area here and is actually relatively difficult. It's a sort of a stippled effect which is normal and it's almost completely obscured by the pectoral muscles and the heart in the ventrodorsal view. So it's actually quite difficult to get an image of what's going on in the lungs uh, in the majority of birds. These are the air sacs. There are paired air sacs. There's usually two um, uh, cranial uh, uh, thoracic, uh, 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 sorry, two cervical air sacs at the top, then two cranial thoracic air sacs, two caudal thoracic air sacs and two abdominal air sacs in the vast majority of cetaciforms. And they each have on each side a stoma that connects with the relevant lung. So effectively they are outpouchings, balloons that come out from the lung. Um, and as we mentioned before, typically the respiratory cycle is through the lungs into the caudal air sacs, from the caudal air sacs back through the lungs into the cranial air sacs, from the cranial air sacs back through the lungs and out of the bird. Uh, and so that actually uh, an air molecule, technically speaking, um, goes through two cycles of inspiration and expiration before it exits the body of a bird. So it has maximum chance of extracting uh, oxygen. Does the appearance of the air sacs change with the working in the respiratory cycle? Do they kind of inflate and deflate or do they stay large? They, they, they do move because it's obviously that the, the main movement for inspiration and expiration is movement of the sternum um, uh, down and out. Uh, and the rib cage out, uh, so there will be a little bit of inflation and deflation of these air sacs, absolutely. So yes, again, ideally you want an inspiratory view if you can, because that's going to give you the greatest contrast in this area and give you more information. Um, the kidneys are tucked up in this area here. So this area is obviously the pelvic area, and this is another area in birds where the anatomy is slightly skew if They've got fused sacral vertebra to the roof of the pelvis and so actually the pelvis almost looks as if it's upside down in birds. They've got this shield over the top instead of in mammals where you've got the wings of the ilia um, and then a pubis on the bottom. The pubis is unfused and there are just two pubic bones and obviously because birds lay eggs um, you can't have a fused pubis otherwise you'd never get an egg to pass through that area. So these two pubic bones are unfused and they just support the caudal body wall. The um, coccygeal vertebra are relatively mobile, but at the end there is a fused lump of coccygeal vertebra, which is known as the piger style, and that is where the deck feathers, the tail feathers, are uh, attached. 
so that they're actually physically attached to the periosteum of the fused last two or three um, coccygeal vertebra, um, which provides a platform for those flight feathers. Interestingly, we'll see on, on wing images later on, the secondaries are fused to the periosteum of the ulna, um, and the primaries are fused to the periosteum um, of the uh, metacarpals and the carpal bones. There are no flight feathers attached to the humerus. Uh, although it looks as if a bird's got feathers all the way down, you, next time you pull one out, have a look, there are no flight feathers in this area uh, here. Um, if we come back to the pelvic limb, we've obviously got two femurs, we've got a stifle joint with a patella, um, so there is a patella in there. There's sometimes in larger birds obvious sesamoids. Um, we'll see in a minute there are often um, uh, significant mineralized cartilages in the tibiotarsal area. This is the tibiotarsal bone, equivalent to the uh, tibia uh, in mammals, but it's called obviously a tibiotarsus because uh, distally, technically speaking, the proximal row of tarsal bones is fused to the end of the tibia. Um, and therefore the joint that um, we would associate with the hock is actually an intertarsal joint, or sometimes referred to as a suffrago joint. And the distal row of tarsal bones is then fused to the metacarpals. In parrots, um, I can see it more clearly on this image here, so we've got femur, we've got um, tibiotarsus, intertarsal joint. This is the tarsometatarsus, so what was the fused distal row of tarsal bones onto the metatarsals. And then we've got the phalanges. And typically a parrot has this zygodactyl foot, so it has two digits pointing forward and two pointing back. Digit one points back, digit two and three point forward, digit four points back, digit five disappeared. Um, and typically digit one is two phalanges, digit two is three, digit three is four, and digit four is five phalanges in a, in a typical cetaciform. Um, we do get obviously other foot uh, forms. So we get um, the anisodactyl limb, which is typical with uh, raptors and with passerines, where um, digit one points back and digits two, three, and four point forward. And then we get a few weird species like the osprey that has a semi-zygodactyl foot where it can flip digit four both forward and backward, uh, mainly an adaptation for, for trying to catch the uh, slippery fish. Um, so it's got the ability to flip this backwards and forwards. Um, as we said, kidneys down in this area in here, so they're difficult to see on this image. Um, and otherwise, body form um, is relatively similar between different species of birds. Um, but the other thing to note is that the vertebra in the back here, in the thoracic area, are also technically fused. We'll see some better images than this because it's difficult to pick up on this one. We've got fused vertebra here in the sacral area. We often have one mobile lumbar vertebra. And then we've got fused vertebra here in the thoracic area to provide a platform for flight. Cervical vertebra are mobile, coccygeal vertebra apart from the last few are mobile, but otherwise there's a lot of fused vertebra. The one mobile uh, lumbar vertebra is an area to look at again for birds that have been involved in road traffic accidents or window strikes because it's uh, a weak point. It's one area that often becomes damaged. Um, so that's a normal parrot. If we look at a normal owl, um, then we begin to see a, a few obvious differences. So first of all, we don't have that hourglass shape. So that's you know, something that's relatively peculiar to cetaciforms, that hourglass shape. It's really useful when we're assessing cetaciforms, as we'll see in a minute. But actually, in other species, it's often more a tubular form. Again, the heart's at the top. We've got liver in here. And then we've got quite a distended um, our abdomen in here. This one's had a meal fairly recently. Uh, we've got the proventriculus coming down into the ventriculus in, in raptors. There is not really a differentiation to look at. There's not a grinding gizzard because they're obviously digesting meat. What they've got is a, an acid secreting top part to an enlarged stomach and the bottom bit is kind of just a sac that sits there and holds the food while it's being digested before then going out into the intestines. Lungs, again, up in this area here. We can see perhaps slightly more easily the one mobile vertebra in this area here. Syncacrum, the fused sacral vertebra with the roof of the pelvis uh, over here. The other thing we can see, this being an owl, slightly weirdly, um, we've got the fibula um, just here, but we're also starting to get, you just see the image of these fine striations. Owls often do have quite mineralized cartilages, um, ligaments, I should say, in the muscles in the tibiotarsal area. Um, uh, again, they're quite good with the feet owls, uh, and this is thought to be a, a, to strengthen the muscle function. Um, we see this 
really significantly mineralize in long-legged birds and galliforms, which we'll see in a minute. Um, otherwise, um, body form relatively similar, slightly less pectoral muscles. We can see the pneumonized femurs in this in this particular one here, the, the, the obvious uh, gas pockets in the in the in the medulla. Um, and we can also see a little diverticulum of um, the uh, uh, caudal thoracic uh, air sac coming down here in between liver um, and uh, and stomach in this particular species, which is just a feature of this particular uh, individual. If we come to falconiforms, so uh, falcons again, more of a tubular um, uh, sort of visceral body organ system with the heart at the top, the liver shadows, again proventriculus in this area here, air sacs around here, pneumonized uh, femurs, lateral view, heart here, um, proventriculus coming down here, bit of liver shadow in here, um, intestinal mass, kidneys, air sac, lungs here. Um, and again, foot-wise, they have this um, uh, anisodactyl limb, um, and there is often um, additional sesamoids in these birds um, in the regions of the intertarsal joint. So there is often additional bones. You'll find these, these occasional sesamoids. You may also find them in the carpal areas, um, which are all about providing a smooth running uh, for um, large tendons. So remember, obviously, raptors use their feet predominantly. That's their main killing weapon uh, for the majority of them. So they have strong ligaments, strong muscles associated with the foot. Um, and uh, they often have uh, these sesamoids to encourage smooth running of these large ligaments. Um, for ducks, for waterfowl, Um, physiologically, this has a, a large egg in it, um, which is waiting to come out. Um, we can see a few peculiar things. We've got a flattened um, keel, so obviously ducks swim, um, so they tend to have not a very prominent keel. They're good strong flyers, but it tends to be flattened. They have a very strong looking um, cor um, uh, clavicle um, and quite um, significant um, uh, again, uh, coracoid bones for good strong flying, pneumonized femurs again, quite a large heart in comparison to body form, um, and uh, um, in this particular case, as I say, obscured by, by eggs and things. So we've got a little bit of a, a grinding gizzard down the bottom here, so they're sort of a, a little bit more like cetaciforms and galliforms, but they do have a proventriculus um, and a gizzard, um, but otherwise um, the body form broadly um, similar. We sometimes also see, and it's worth just noting, where the trachea comes into this area here, in males, you may get a significant diverticulum around this area, um, which is often referred to as an auditory bulla, and that's actually relatively normal. It appears as a gas-filled chamber in this area where the syrinx should be. So remember, birds, the voice comes from the bottom of the trachea, not the top. Um, and a lot of ducks, you know, that long annoying call that can keep you awake uh, all night, um, will have in drakes uh, a, a resonating chamber on the side of that, which appears as a large uh, uh, mineralized structure uh, just to the side uh, of the syrinx. Um, and then galliforms. So we get to galliforms, again, grinding stomach like the cetaciforms, quite a lot of digestive tract in galliforms. So it tends to fill a lot of that caudal salomic cavity. We've got um, a significant uh, area in the front here for a crop. And so not all birds have a crop. So a lot of the, the cetaciforms, passerines, galliforms have one. Galliforms obviously have a particularly large crop. So we've actually got a recurved um, a keel, a shorter keel bone in this particular case. Um, they have a sort of an intermediate uh, hour shaped figure, not particularly uh, wasted in the middle there, um, as it is with um, uh, uh, cytosines, quite stout limbs, uh, because obviously these guys spend a lot of time on the ground, and they've got lots of mineralized tendons um, in uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the muscles, ligaments in the muscles. Tendons, I should say. Um, and then small passerines, um, so again, a body form similar. Um, uh, we've got again heart at the front here. We've got a grinding um, stomach depending on the species. Um, this is a, a little thrush that's actually got some mineralized deposits in it. It's picked up some metal work. Um, but longer limbs, so we've got uh, longer tarsometatarsal areas. Remember in the 
Um, Cetaciform, this area is really short. Um, these guys much longer, longer legged in that area. But we can also get the impression of these flight feathers attached actually directly onto the periosteum of the ulna uh, in this area. So when you're pulling flight feathers, again, I'd encourage you to anesthetize birds before you start uh, pulling out flight feathers. Uh, it is painful. And there is a small risk that you can create um, a little bit of a periosteal reaction, which can then encourage them to have a bit of a feather pluck at the area because it's sore afterwards. We can do contrast studies in birds. They are somewhat uh, difficult uh, because you need to uh, effectively try and do it conscious and then anaesthetize the bird and do it conscious and anaesthetize the bird. They have very short gut transit times. Um, uh, in most cases with cetaciforms, you're talking from one end to the other uh, in a matter of two to four hours. Um, so this is really quite uh, normal, but we can see into the crop in this area here, into the proventriculus into the ventriculus and we're starting to get into the intestines. So we can see the, the, the course of the proventriculus left side into the ventriculus and then into intestinal mass. Crop, most species tends to sit predominantly to the right side of the neck, but a lot of them it's quite large and actually comes across uh, both uh, sides of the neck. Why do we want to do a contrast studies? Well, we could look for foreign bodies and you can see, um, sorry, we'll just flip back to this one. We can see the infilling um, with food ingester in this area here, and so that may be useful. Um, however, uh, we may also, particularly in parrots, want to look at uh, conditions like dilatation of um, the stomach. So this is proventricular, proventricular dilatation disease, um, which we know is associated with, with a bornavirus infection. So we've got two uh, grey parrots here. This is uh, a normal um, a barium contrast. Uh, in this particular one, this is abnormal. What we've done here is we've uh, actually under anesthesia, which is a technique which makes life slightly easier, instead of just crop tubing it, under anesthesia, if you're careful, you can actually with a straight crop tube, gently thread or indeed with a, a feeding tube, uh, work your way down into the crop, which you can palpate down the neck, and then work your way into the cranial chest so actually bypass the crop go over the top of it um, and then just inject your contrast in that area it just means that you can then immediately take your x-ray uh, and know that it's actually going to go into um, your stomachs um, and this one here we can see we've actually got um, distension of the proventriculus uh, widening of the proventricular ventricular junction um, this one's a more normal one with a contraction wave, and this is typical in early stages of proventricular dilatation disease. Diagnosis of proventricular dilatation disease is still usually made uh, based on either uh, PCR detection of the organism, uh, serology, um, or biopsy uh, either of proventriculus or more typically, because it's less risky, biopsy of the crop. Uh, and usually you, you biopsy the uh, uh, crop over a blood vessel, so you get a nerve with it because you want to look at the nerves for evidence of uh, lymphocytic plasmacytic infiltrates, which are typical with proventricular dilatation disease. But uh, confirmation uh, with radiography can be useful. Um, we can obviously see issues with metabolic bone disease. We mentioned a little bit about this yesterday. And we typically see this obviously in young birds, um, captive ones. These are uh, a cytosine uh, chick here where we've got um, folding fractures um, of the tibiotarsus here. We've got folding fractures of the humerus. We've got um, uh, obviously very uh, abnormally shaped tibiotarsal bones here with a 90 degree bend in it. Um, these sorts of injuries, spontaneous folding fractures um, and uh, uh, and the like are not reversible. These are, these are not manageable. Uh, so this uh, particular individual, unfortunately, was euthanized. Um, but we can see it in wild birds as well. Um, so it's not just a disease of captivity. This is, this is obviously a husbandry issue. Um, so this is um, a wild uh, uh, bird, uh, a raptor, uh, and we've got tibiotarsal bowing. And it's usually the tibiotarsi or the tarsometatarsi, the long bones of the legs, which are the ones. And it's often, um, you know, in things like barn owls with the lesser chicks, obviously they have a hatching regime with barn owls, and the later chicks often are not being fed as well uh, and uh, being outcompeted. And if they survive, they often have uh, mild metabolic bone disease issues. They've grown, they've got quite heavy, um, but the weight on the bones then causes them to bend. 
So it's not unusual to find these skeletal deformities in wild birds as well as captive ones. We talked about looking for injuries, and this is this mobile lumbar vertebra. And this is quite a good place to look when you've got birds that have had window strike or car strike injuries and you're concerned about um, you know, uh, pelvic limb function. Um, they maybe aren't gripping well or they're maybe not even standing at all but seem very bright at the front end. This is the area to have a, a look at in the first instance. So we've got cranial end, obviously this end, the two humeri. This is the notarium, the fused uh, thoracic vertebra. This is uh, the syncacrum, the pelvis and, and fused sacral vertebra. And this is your mobile uh, single lumbar vertebra at this point. And this is your weak point. It's there because obviously it allows swivel movement of the caudal end of the bird. So when it's flying, it can maneuver itself with its tail feathers um, to actually steer itself. Um, so it's there for good anatomical reasons. But of course, it is the weak point when a bird hits something and the back end then follows in to the front end. That's the area that often subluxates, um, disc uh, collapse or fracture. Um, so it's worth taking a couple of views uh, of that. This, we've got a compression fracture here and a partial subluxation. Um, yes, these are, are grim prognoses. Um, other things that are common in birds and that we really need to look at quite closely are, are the feet of birds, particularly in raptors, but also in uh, um, uh, perching birds and, and waterfowl, because bumblefoot pododermatitis is really common. <laughs> And with pododermatitis, I'd always encourage you to, you know, even if you think it's superficial and soft tissue, I would encourage you to do radiographs of the feet because ultimately, if there is a periosteal reaction uh, of a mild level, the prognosis is that much worse. And so you're, you're, you're in keeping your client well informed as to the prognosis. Um, and you'll find with some raptor owners, um, you know, that the... the, the the cost of treatment is going to far exceed the value in their eyes of the bird. Similarly, you may have an owner that wants to spend whatever on it, but it's still important up front to have a better idea of what's going on. So we may have um, feet where we've got um, serious um, uh, 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 periosteal reaction and bone formation bridging joints. We may have soft tissue reactions. So we've got a normal foot here. We've got soft tissue reaction associated with a central pad here. We don't appear to have bony change. What we do have is a little bit of uh, soft tissue reaction going around the nail bed of that particular foot. We may, however, have complete joint abscessation and disruption, as we've got in this duck down here. Um, uh, or we may have just fluffy periosteal reaction and loss of contrast and detail going on. Um, anything with bony involvement, anything with joint involvement clearly carries a worse prognosis. If it's just soft tissue and it's not affecting tendons, the prognosis is good. If it's affecting tendons, the prognosis is uh, slightly guarded. If it's into bone, prognosis is, is um, usually poor. Um, it doesn't mean to say that treatment can't be tried, but it's going to be expensive, it's going to take time, and it may fail. Um, in in, in long-standing cases, yes, that is perfectly possible to see mineralization of tendons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, usually, owners usually have brought uh, cases um, to us before then. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if they've been left, absolutely. Um, and again, um, you know, we may be able to determine uh, other things. This is a, a, a cock of the rock. It's an Andean species. Um, these things exchange hands for about, this is a male, for about £40,000 a pair. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's quite a, therefore, a, a regular trade uh, in catching them in the wild and bringing them into captivity. And we see a lot of this, unfortunately, in birds. We see an awful lot of it in reptiles, although they're rarely quite as uh, valuable as the birds. Um, and typical open rings. We've got, uh, in this case, evidence of an old healed fracture on the leg. They're often fairly simple, low technology, you know, feed the bird on the ground with a trap net with a stick in it that you pull out the way and then the trap door comes down and whacks the bird and uh, they catch it. Um, but we can also see other evidence, um, you know, historically this is a, a wild osprey um, that has been um, shot. Uh, and it has broken the radius. Um, the good news is radial fractures usually heal quite well on their own. The bad news is if it's a falcon, then that can be a real issue because you often get a synostosis forming between the radius and the ulna. Um, and most of the falcons need, you know, really fine flight and particularly anything that hovers. Um, 
Ospreys may be also affected by that, perhaps slightly less. If you're talking about things like buzzards and things like that, they usually do really well because they're big soaring birds and they don't need that fine wing control. So again, when we're talking about prognosis and radiographic signs, depends upon the species you're dealing with, depends upon what the owner's using that particular individual for, if it's owner related. Uh, if we're releasing it back into the wild, then okay, we need to think carefully about whether or not this particular species individual has normal wing function. Can it function in the wild? Or am I putting back a bird that is just going to starve slowly um, should, uh, should that happen? But yes, forensic stuff, sometimes you find stuff that you kind of go, oh no, really, open ring and a fracture that's healed does make you feel a little bit nervous. Um, this is um, just some uh, images of the wing, just to give you an idea about how well seated those flight feathers genuinely, uh, genuinely are um, on the periosteum. So they're right onto the bone, the ulna bone here, um, and onto um, the uh, uh, carpal bones, the metacarpal bones, sorry, and phalangeal bones. Um, and um, primaries on the hand of the bird, secondaries um, on the antibrachium, nothing flight feather wise um, on the humerus. Um, Propatagium along here, and we can just see uh, obviously the little increased spots on it which where flight feathers are, are attached. We've got the little um, thumb of the bird, so they've, they've pretty much got a, a major digit and a minor digit um, uh, to the distal wing, but they've also still got a thumb, uh, the alula, the uh, sometimes referred to as the bastard wing, um, but it's, it's there for um, are controlling the airflow over the surface of the wing. It's very well developed in birds that hover and glide and they'll use it. It's got a tuft of feathers on it. Some species of birds, um, they actually still have the prehistoric claw on the end of it. Um, so if, do any of you have chickens? Old, old breed chickens? Things like light Sussex or marins or things like that. Um, have a look closely the next time you get to your to your light Sussex or thing at the um, the little tufty thumb, the alula, you'll find a claw. It's still there in the chickens. Um, it's there in peregrine falcons and things like that as well. Um, so a lot of birds still have that prehistoric Archaeopteryx claw in that area. But it's there effectively a bit like an aerolon um, in, a, in a plane and it's on the leading edge of the wing to control the speed of airflow over the wing so they stop some stalling. They can flip the area up and down. So actually that's quite important in some species of gliding birds. If that's broken, that's, that's not necessarily good news. This is the um, anterior-posterior view of the wing, which you absolutely can't do with holding a bird. Um, but uh, sometimes you can get a bit of an idea. The wing's not straight. You often think the wing's straight. It's not straight. It has to have a bend on it. So the whole wing is actually bent um, to form that domed, what we associate as a wing shape, um, to give that lift. So this is the underside, the ventral aspect, the dorsal aspect. You can see the flight feathers curling in there. Um, humerus elbow joint, rad uh, ulna, radius, um, uh, carpal bones, metacarpals, uh, alula uh, in there. Why is that area quite important? Well, not just to see that, because also we can get, this one's a bit dark, unfortunately, but you can get an increased idea. We've got increased radio densities coming all the way down here. This is edema, this is wingtip edema, which is typically associated in, in birds of prey with frostbite. Um, it can occur through uh, thromboembolic disease, but it's much more commonly associated with frostbite. So tethered raptors that are tethered outside or tethered in weatherings, these three-sided, often roofed enclosures, which are typical for housing during the summer, um, and then you get um, an early frost and the bird's tethered low to ground and they get frostbite in the wingtips. And so blood supply is compromised, you get uh, edema, as you'd expect with any sort of uh, necrosis. Um, and unfortunately, in severe cases, you'll get wingtip sloughing associated with it. But you'll get this typical pattern of increased radio densities around the feather shafts coming into the wing. Um, I mean, you'll be able to grossly see that the, obviously the, the, the wingtip itself is discoloured. Um, but this, when you've got radiographic changes as well, the prognosis is therefore not, not, not so good. Um, obviously, birds um, particularly um, lend themselves to external fixators fracture repair and so on. Um, so a radiography is key 
to ensure you've got good positioning of fixators. Um, so we're starting to assemble this particular one here um, and uh, avoidance of joints and make sure that you're actually engaging uh, both articular surfaces. They may be simple like that one. They may be quite complicated and long like this one uh, with long legged birds. So this is the tibia tarsus of a flamingo that we've got multiple uh, pins attached to the outside of uh, in the attempt to, to bridge and support that. Um, Fractures often in raptors, actually this is a galliform, but often in raptors will occur in this um, tarsometatarsal area, which is where the jesses are going to be, um, because that's often a, a common falconer's novice mistake, is to tether a bird on a leash um, and leave the leash too long. You want it long enough that the bird drops off its perch, that it can get to the ground, to its water bowl or whatever, but you don't want it so long that the bird can, if it's frightened, can get up to speed, because then when the leash snaps taut, um, that's going to put um, extreme pressure uh, on the jesses uh, uh, which are attached to the little anklets which are around this area here. And then you get fractures. This particular galliform had a big solid ring on it which it managed to catch on something and then panicked and flapped and broke its leg. So this is a pheasant that managed to do this. Um, and then these are difficult to get things across. So we've got an external fixator uh, made of ECF putty uh, and multiple transarticular, uh, transcortical uh, and uh, single cortical pins um, to go through it. But these are, these are messy uh, fractures. And in a falcon, um, these are going to be difficult to avoid tying down tendons. That's the big problem with surgery with that. Neil will definitely talk to you about more about that sort of thing. Um, the, the chances of the bird being um, having effective use of its foot afterwards in a falcon is, is, is guarded. Beak fractures uh, are another common uh, problem. Um, and uh, we see this obviously in particularly in um, some of the, the longer beaked birds. So this is a stalk. Um, the black stalk that we've got here, we've put a little external ESF putty fixator on it. These guys, it's really more to highlight the fact that um, when you fracture a beak, it is difficult to put external fixators in it and for the external fixators to be sighted in bone that is sufficiently dense that it's going to hold. Uh, in some cases, if, if it's, it's loosely aligned and it's being held somewhat by the, the actual horn, by the keratin, the natatheca in this case, that's covering the beak, actually using a kind of an ESF putty type um, technique um, or gluing straps across it um, to buttress and support it from the outside is preferable um, to trying to stick pins through it because the pins loosen with time um, and they're, they're not embedded in anything solid as we can see in here. When you get to smaller uh, birds with fractures these ones can be particularly difficult um, to manage. Uh, this one's actually got quite a nasty disrupted intertarsal joint and knee joint as well so this one's probably not uh, long for uh, this world. Um, we see a lot of cardiac cases uh, in uh, parrots um, and so this is a galah cockatoo um, and just to orientate yourself again, ventrodorsal view, got it relatively square on, we've got the keel overlying backbone, uh, coracoids, humeri, femurs, heart shadow, liver, proventriculus, digestive tract, air sacs, uh, lungs. So subjectively, we've got a bit of an idea that we've actually got um, maybe less of a waste to that. On the lateral view, actually, it does seem that the heart rises quite significantly into the body of the bird. There are some rough rules of thumb that one can do in parrots in particular to assess cardiac size. Um, and the first one of which is to look at the heart uh, on the ventrodorsal view and measure the heart at its widest width and then measure the chest at the level of the fifth pair of ribs, which is usually the widest point of the, of the cranial part of the salomic cavity. And you would expect that the heart width should be less than 50% of the width of the widest portion of the chest. This is relatively subjective. Um, it works relatively well in parrots. It does not work terribly well in a lot of other species. And unfortunately, again, rather frustratingly, that is kind of where we're stuck at this precise moment in time, because actually, you know, cardiac heart scores um, have not been worked out for uh, the 99.9% .9 of species of birds. There is a paper in the most recent uh, Journal of Avian Medicine and Surgery, for all of you enthusiastic avian vets, um, on the radiographic reference values for the cardiac silhouette in Bonelli's eagle 
which is great if you've got a Bonelli's Eagle. Um, and they are looking at uh, a comparing the cardiac silhouette width should occupy 81 to 93 percent of the sternal width. So they're measuring the silhouette versus the sternal width. Um, it should be 48 to 50 percent of the thoracic width, this bit. Um, and it should be 50, five, 506 to 673% of the coracoid width. So they're actually going in for taking a whole bunch of measurements to try and find some reference value. And this is our problem, is that we don't have a lot of data on this. There's very little published. Um, for cytosines, the rough rule of thumb, 50% at the widest point is not a bad starting point, um, but it's about as good as we've got at the minute. I'm sure further papers, and I'm sure... All of you will be writing papers as you go through your career on these things. So there's lots and lots of research you can get published. I mean, seriously, from practice, you know, you've got a breeder of African grey parrots and you want to produce a cardiac score. Um, you probably can do it if you can uh, uh, get together enough radiographs. Um, we may well see advanced heart failure as we've got in this uh, minor bird here, uh, where we've got significant cardiac enlargement and actually we've got ascites. We've got a complete whiteout going on in here. Um, and this loss of detail that we've got going on in the salomic cavity. And you can almost see, can you see this line that's appeared here, which is perhaps the most obvious thing on it? That is where the lungs start. I can't see any air sacs. Now the air sacs are probably somewhat squished. They've not disappeared, but I'm now looking through air sac, through fluid, through air sac. Whereas normally I would be looking in this area, through air sac, through air sac, and body wall on either side, and that's it, and therefore it would be radiolucent. I've now got fluid in there. This is ascites associated in this particular instance with cardiac failure uh, in this particular individual. Um, typically in parrots, one of the conditions we're most concerned about is aspergillosis, and in parrots, the good news is that aspergillosis frequently occupies the caudal air sacs. In penguins, unfortunately, it doesn't. It tends to occupy the cranial air sacs and the lungs, which makes it very difficult to diagnose. So coming back to the, to the silhouette again, we've got the heart silhouette here, we've got the liver silhouette in here with a proventriculus. Um, on the lateral view, we can see in this what should be a dark a radiolucent area, we've got some infilling going on in here. It's not really clear what it is. On this view, however, we can see this particular lesion in here. Um, and we've also got a little bit of an impression that although that's square on, it is nicely positioned, it appears that the viscera on this left side appears to be slightly closer to the left wall than it should be. Okay, We've not got a symmetrical hourglass like we should have in this area. And this is associated with ad adhesions and air sac scarring in that area. And that is a granuloma, an aspergilloma that's growing in that uh, caudal thoracic air sac, which is typical uh, of aspergillosis. We may see um, other symptoms which are much more severe with aspergillosis. And this African grey parrot here has lost completely the right side of its air sacs. So we've got cranial, um, caudal thoracic, and abdominal affected, and the entire shadow has moved to the left-hand side. Again, we've got a nice square on view. We've also got increased density in this area here, which is highly suspicious that we've probably got something down that side, but we can often get this unilateral one-sided image uh, with aspergillosis. We can get other infections of air sacs which are not necessarily aspergillus associated, and we may actually see the air sacs. So this is a macaw. Macaws often have a very pronounced waist. They often have a very narrow looking hourglass shape uh, and are quite a small heart size. They're often referred to as microcardiac on these images. And what we've got here is we can suddenly see a line, a, a, a radio dense area in between or in the middle of these air sacs on this image. Um, and this is not a discrete granuloma. Um, it could be aspergillosis, but it could also just be a general air sacculitis. This particular one um, had psittacosis and had an air sacculitis associated with it because we shouldn't be able to see the air sac line. You know, these are onion skin thin. They should really be beyond the resolution range of most radiographic units. Uh, so if we're starting to see them very obviously like that, we've got thickening going on. 
We may also see ruptured air sacs. This one here um, is a bird that's had a, a traumatic incident, and we've actually got the um, cervical air sac has actually um, ruptured into the subcutaneous space and is starting to balloon out <coughs> around the rest of the bird. Um, so we can actually see it connecting in here, but it's starting to spread subcutaneously. And sometimes these birds, you, you pick them up and they're like bubble wrap. You know, they're, they're, they've got all this air underneath the, the skin because they've had a collision with something. One of them has ruptured into the subcutaneous uh, space. And again, a serious um, aspergillus case in this grey here uh, as well. So lateral view, you get a bit of an idea of an infilling going on here. Ventrodorsal view, yeah, okay, we've got something really serious going on here. We've lost the hourglass completely. Uh, the entire side is affected. That's going to be a, a grim prognosis for that particular individual. Um, we may also see enlarged um, other enlarged body organs, such as spleens. So um, in this particular instance, we've got a couple of images. We've got a normal one here with nothing much going on. In this particular one here, you can see there's an image in this area here of a circular organ. Um, it's difficult to see on this particular one, but it's in this area in here. Uh, but on the lateral, it's usually just above um, the gizzard and about mid-thigh, which is useful because if you can see it, the spleen of cetaciforms is circular, uh, spherical I should say, um, and uh, it appears at about mid-thigh level and if it's generally considered uh, more than the width of the thigh bone, it's considered enlarged. So you sometimes occasionally will, will pick it up, but if it's very, very obvious, um, then um, uh, it probably is uh, increased in size, and then measure it against the thigh bone, and if it's more than the width of the thigh bone, um, then you've got splenomegaly. There are obviously many things that could cause splenomegaly uh, in birds, but in cetaciforms, one of the most common is psittacosis, again. So it's another thing that gives you a little bit of information to make you concerned about a specific condition. Um, we can see other things which are much more difficult to pick up on uh, uh, radiography. This one has got actually uh, an enlarged um, uh, kidney tumour. Again, we've lost the dark radiolucent area in these uh, caudal thoracic air sacs. We can't see very much at all on the ventrodorsal image, but this is um, a budgerigal. Um, these typically are associated with um, gonad or uh, kidney uh, neoplasia and often infilling in this area, typically associated with unilateral limb paresis or lameness. Um, and uh, in this particular um, individual, we've also got hyperostosis, this is a female, we've got hyperostosis of the thigh bone and the tibia tarsus. And this is typical in egg-laying female birds. The um, thigh bones and the um, tibia are often used as calcium deposition and mobilization sites, and these compulsive egg-laying female budgerigars uh, often uh, will have this increased radio density and slightly mottled appearance um, to these uh, long bones. Um, we can clearly see this particular one, we can't clearly see on this particular image because the image has come out slightly um, wonky. Um, this particular one um, was supposed to be showing you. Um, we've got an obvious fracture uh, up the top here, uh, a radius and ulna fracture um, from a, a bullet fragment. Um, and this particular one had um, GI stasis. I don't quite know what's happened to that OT image. I apologize for that one. We'll move on to another one. Um, yeah, this one's slightly better. Uh, hepatomegaly, this is a badly positioned x-ray, so I apologise for this. Legs should be pulled cordially, they're, they're, they're up around its ears somewhere and on this particular one here. However, we get a bit of an idea that there is no waste to this hourglass figure uh, on this particular one. Uh, it was the most extreme one I could find, so it was worth uh, pulling out. We've got something that's filling in the bottom end of the hourglass shape. Um, now, it could be that that is a space occupying lesion in the center of the body. So there aren't too many things that are going to do that. One of the things though that could do it on the left side would be the proventriculus. So there's always a possibility you could have proventricular dilatation going on here and it's pushing the lobes of the liver out. Um, so that is a possibility. Um, and therefore we might want to do a contrast um, uh, uh, GI tract study in order to highlight where the proventriculus is to rule that one out. Um, this happens to be an Amazon parrot, and it was a bit on the fat side, and certainly this is hepatic lipidosis uh, in this particular case. 
if we've ruled out the proventriculus, um, we can then look at the liver shadow in these guys and we can draw a line from the shoulder joint to the hip joint and the liver shadow should fall between those two lines, okay, in cetaciforms. If it is out with those two lines, either the liver is enlarged or there is something in between the liver, like the proventriculus, that is pushing the liver out and needs investigation. So a line between shoulder joint um, and hip joint, both sides, liver shadow should be within that line. And on the lateral view here, again, bad positioning, got the heart in here, we've got something filling that area in there. And actually it's all one organ. Um, and you can sort of see the line that comes up the back here and across here and then down here and round there. And that's one lobe of the liver superimposed on the other lobe of the liver. The intestines are over here. Um, this is a massive uh, hepatic lipidosis. Clearly, birds are ideal candidates for diagnosing things like egg binding. This is a grey with a, uh, a significant egg in it. Um, this is why egg binding is uh, an emergency, uh, why we need to get this um, out of there, or at least relieve the pressure. You can see it's pushed a lot of the viscera back into the air sac area. This bird's often dyspneic. Um, but actually it's putting pressure on the kidneys, which are up in here, it's putting pressure on the root um, of the mesentery, and therefore we can get ischemic necrosis, we can get other serious issues associated with that if that egg's not, uh, not removed. And this particular image uh, is relatively poor because we're dealing with a very poorly mineralized, very small uh, little parakeet here. Um, but this one has a collapsed egg, you can probably just get an idea, an impression of a collapsed egg in here. But we've also got a ventral hernia. That is its gizzard, that little bit of grit that's up there. Okay, So we've got a massive ventral hernia. And this is typical with chronic egg laying small parakeets. They often, with hyperestrogenism, they often have quite well mineralized thigh bones um, and tibia. So we've got this mottled appearance again. They often develop hernias. So the estrogen has a weakening effect on the muscle and the continuous egg laying. Um, and eventually they get exhaustion um, and they produce malformed eggs. Some of them get egg yolk coelomitis, a lot of them get egg binding and collapsed eggs inside it. And the egg can't negotiate its way out of the tract because the tract is now part of this hernia. Um, so these, these guys have some real problems when it comes to the, the end stage of compulsive egg laying. Um, and uh, typically this is an egg yolk coelomitis associated with it. So again, gizzard is over here. We've got a ventral hernia in here. There's possibly a little bit of egg fragment uh, just down here. But this one actually had an egg yolk coelomitis. So again, we've got a line appearing up here where the caudal edge of the lung field is. We've got general loss of detail in the coelomic cavity associated, in this case, not with ascites, but with coelomitis. Um, so we've just lost all serosal detail in this area. We can obviously see the hernia, uh, so that could be uh, something like a, a, an ascitic bird, or it could be uh, certainly egg yolk coelomitis, which it was in that case. Foreign bodies, easy to see. Penguins always swallowing stones and other things of that nature. Most of them vomit them back up again. Occasionally we have uh, issues with them. Um, but actually a lot of cetaciforms in houses are inquisitive. Uh, these are little bits of uh, pewter lead fragments. Um, this cockatiel has managed to chew from an expensive wine bottle top and managed to give itself lead poisoning uh, in the process. The good news is they show up really nicely clearly on radiograph. Uh, the bad news is you've got to get all those things back out again. Um, this is a Harris hawk. Um, this one has, well, spot the very obvious thing that it's got in it. got an air sac tube in it. Okay, so we've bunged an air sac tube in it. Um, so it's just gone through the body wall there into the abdominal air sac. So we're breathing for it because the bird wasn't breathing terribly well um, through the other orifice. Um, what might, what can you see that is perhaps not entirely right about this bird? Something above his heart, yes. What's that? This, it's a bone, yes. This was bird was being flown for quarry uh, and had managed to wolf down part of a rabbit uh, before the owner managed to get it off said rabbit, had managed to wolf down one and a half vertebra from the rabbit and then get it wedged in its, um, just in front of the proventriculus, right above the heart base, which was giving it some 
quite uh, serious uh, problems at this particular stage. Certainly breathing problems because it was pressing on the syrinx and making it difficult to breathe and poking up into the lungs. And it was also causing a bit of a cardiac output failure. So occasionally you get weird things like that. Difficult to see on this view. So again, <laughs> the advantage of two views. Um, uh, yes, yes, anaesthetize and then yeah, endoscopy. Yeah, you just needed to knock it, knock it back in and then pull it back out again. Um, but it got its wedged across. So I don't quite know how it managed to do it, but it, it managed to get itself wedged. Um, and then you get weird ones which sort of have been sitting around for some considerable period of time. So this is a, a, a crane uh, from a zoological collection. We've got a microchip down here, um, up here. Um, so long-legged bird, long-winged bird. Um, they do have a little bit of an hourglass shape, but again, different body form. Um, and we've got this thing up here, uh, which is a nail. Um, these are inquisitive birds. Cranes often have very stout uh, furcular. Um, they often have, some of them have coils of trachea in this cranial area, um, which give them a, uh, their, some of the booming calls. Uh, but this one had managed to swallow a nail uh, and uh, it had then perforated its gut and had obviously been there for some time. Um, but uh, they're incredibly inquisitive and will pick up any sort uh, of um, object that is in their environment. This is, or should be, in your notes. Um, it is worth noting that we can increase magnification at the risk of sacrificing clarity, obviously, to a certain extent, but with small stuff, and this applies obviously to the, to the small mammals as well, uh, by um, increasing um, patient object to film distance um, in relation to focal to film distance. So basically um, we can um, uh, uh, raise effectively the patient above the x-ray plate or the imaging device, um, which will then create obviously um, uh, an exaggerated image. So if we had our, our, our mouse on the plate, we're going to get our image like that. If we raise said mouse up to this level, bearing in mind we're doing it from a focal source, then what we're going to get is a super mouse on our plate. The, 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 so the bad news is you will sacrifice some clarity uh, in the process, um, but there is a rough rule of thumb for birds that's been worked out, uh, which is as follows. So average weights of different species of birds, looking at different areas, KVs, MA, uh, seconds, patient object to film distance and focal to film distance um, uh, to give that extra bit of magnification. Um, so for ultrasound, um, we, birds do not lend themselves well to ultrasound because of the air sac system. So there are some exceptions to the rule uh, in certain medical conditions, and we can use certain organs of the bird as acoustic windows. The liver is the most typical because it's close to the body surface, and we can use it to image things like heart and obviously look at the liver. Um, but actually with a lot of the air sacs inside birds, it makes life very difficult. Um, Cytosines also have a keel bone that comes right the way down quite far cordially and then the pelvis and they've really got a very narrow window that you can actually stick an ultrasound probe on. Things like galliforms and columbiforms have a deep v-notch um, in the lateral body wall above the keel uh, where the ribs come in in a v-shape and you can often get the probe up onto the side of the body um, to image the liver um, and occasionally uh, intestines. Um, but that's not, not possible in, in, in um, uh, pig, uh, parrots. Preferably, this um, should be done under general anaesthetic so you don't get bitten and the bird doesn't cause it too much stress. We're generally requiring from most of the species we're dealing with um, 10 megahertz, if possible, uh, uh, transducers. Um, and this is typical of what we can see using the liver as an acoustic window. This is that galar cockatoo, remember, that had the enlarged heart. Um, so we're coming in from the caudal keel here. We're imaging through the liver and up to the heart. So the um, base of the heart's up here. The apex is here. This is the liver. We've got, obviously, um, a, a little bit of a flashback here coming because we've hit um, part of an air sac on this side, and this is what makes life difficult. Um, but we can see we have got a pericardial effusion 
we've got left ventricle, right ventricle, right atria, and we may be able to assess things like valves uh, in these images, but we've got a bit of an idea that things uh, are going uh, wrong. We may be able to put across the valves, however, so we've got the faint outline uh, of the heart here, and we're actually across the mitral valve here, um, and we may be able to assess uh, valve function, uh, and we may be able to assess turbulence in bird hearts, um, and we may, I'm hoping this is going to work, you see, it's going to work. <laughs> this is the drones. It's not going to do it, is it? <coughs> no. Okay. Um, I'll try and see what I can do about that and get it up on your Moodle platform anyway. Um, this is the joys of, I had to send these things through on Friday and clearly it's not, <coughs> it's embedded but it's not linked. Um, so this is um, the heart of a um, rainbow lorikeet. Um, are using the window as an, losing the liver as a, a window, acoustic window, um, and we're coming in um, again through the um, uh, apex of the heart to the base, um, and we've got the heart valves in here. Um, and uh, if this thing will play, then you'll be able to see the actual movement of the heart. But it's not a great image. This is a small 130 gram bird with a 10 megahertz transducer. It is difficult to get decent images in these small creatures. So we are getting a subjective image. This one heart was actually normal. We've not got any pericardial effusion. It was, seems to be functioning okay. The valves seem to be okay. Um, but um, these are difficult. They're right at the kind of edge uh, of um, uh, the ultrasound uh, capabilities. We may um, see obvious things. This is um, plugged onto the uh, mid uh, coelom of uh, a parrot, and this is uh, an inspissated yolk flo flo floating freely within the salomic cavity. So you can get a little bit of an idea of the uh, echo dense yolk in the center. We've got um, the uh, slightly hypoechoic albumin around it. We've got a little bit of a, uh, a shell, but we're getting into it with not more <coughs> membranes more than anything else, but it's actually floating free within the salomic cavity. It's not actually inside um, the salpinks in this particular case. So this is an ectopic egg production. We may get conditions like ascites, which make life an awful lot easier when you're trying to image because then you can see these are layers of intestines here with a lot of ascitic fluid, a little bit of liver over the side here. This is in a toucan that's got hemochromatosis and ascites is associated with it. Uh, we may see hepatic lipidosis as we've got in this um, uh, uh, Amazon parrot where you can see the caudal vena cava coming back over this way. Uh, we've got um, uh, generally an enlarged size of the liver. We've got increased echogenicity in comparison to, to this one over here, for example. Um, and this is typical with hepatic lipidosis. And again, we can see other conditions. This is hemochromatosis, and this particular one here, we've got cavitating lesions in the liver itself. So we've actually got areas of hemorrhage uh, and then ascites associated uh, with this particular organ. So some things work, and some things unfortunately don't in birds. CT works quite nicely. The skeleton, this is a, a rock hopper. Um, and uh, just again to give us an idea of anatomy, um, so CT scanning, if your clients are, are interested in it for fractures, obviously, in the first instance, most useful, but can also be used to diagnose things like aspergillosis. And of course, um, endoscopy um, is something that we routinely use in birds because they lend themselves so well to it. And for those who are not doing it, this is a typical uh, left side of the approach. You can go in either left or right. Left is typically used, obviously, for sexing birds or used to be uh, because the, the females obviously only have a left ovary. Birds place a lateral recumbency under general anaesthesia, wings are held dorsally, uh, legs pulled cordially. We're using the cranial edge of the thigh, so we're going in the same place we're sticking an air sac tube in. So basically halfway between backbone and keel, just in front of the leading edge of the thigh, making a nick in the skin, blunt dissecting with hemostats, and then popping a rigid scope in to have a look 
at what's going on inside. Um, and we can see varying different things associated with that, and this is typical with aspergillosis. So we can actually see the fungus growing in there, lovely, fluffy, horrible bread moulds growing inside it. This one actually is not going into a body cavity, this is actually looking down the trachea, uh, and this is capillaria uh, in the trachea of a raptor. So this is a, a, a bunch of nematodes that are actually uh, coiled up uh, in the lining of the trachea. Uh, this is typical uh, uh, aspergillosis lung uh, from a Gen 2 penguin uh, associated with infections like this. So these are often uh, really advanced and severe um, diseases. Right, what we'll do is we'll do a little bit of um, this and we'll probably break early for lunch because I think uh, Stephanie was saying that Georgia was here and wanted to see you from sort of half one-ish. So what we'll do is we'll do another 10, 15 minutes. Of, actually, just excuse me, just two seconds. I'll just check whether lunch will actually be ready at half past 12 because that will be useful in the first place. It's all going down there. It's a little while I haven't seen anything and then do that so you can get to see Georgia. Right, well in the meantime, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll look at reptiles. Um, so uh, we can obviously do physical restraint uh, for, for reptile radiography. Um, clearly we don't, not, don't want to be in with the reptile, obviously for health and safety reasons when we're doing it, but uh, it is possible for some docile ones to be plonked on a plate and walk off and do it. Um, we can obviously use um, imaginative things like tin cans for things like colonia, just to chock them up so they can't actually wiggle about. Um, vega vega reflexes, you've got grumpy things that you maybe don't want to anaesthetize, may uh, uh, make a big difference and just calm them down sufficiently uh, for a brief period so that you can actually position them. Um, but actually, um, chemical restraint um, may be required, particularly if you're going to do something else more noxious to them. Positioning wise, we're looking at traditionally two views, obviously, again. So we're looking at a dorsoventral view and a lateral view. But actually, in um, colonia and squamates, we're wanting to consider um, lateral beam radiography. So we're wanting to consider uh, firing the radiographic beam horizontally so that effectively we're putting the plate vertically behind them. Why do we want to do this? Well, there's no diaphragm in there, apart from the fact it's very difficult to balance a tortoise on its side. Um, you want a normal positioning of viscera. So the lungs are up here in the dorsal carapace, the viscera is down here. You turn the tortoise on its side, the viscera will simply obliterate the lung field and make it almost impossible to interpret what's going on. This also happens in squamates. In snakes, you can get away with vertical beam radiography because they're a bit like fish, all their internal body organs are held with fibrous attachments. So you can put a snake on its side and you can take an image and it will still be interpretable. But for the colonia and squamates, you need to do horizontal beam. And for colonia, we've got a third view that we can use, which is a cranial caudal view. So basically we're aiming the crosshairs of the beam on the nuchal uh, area um, and we're putting the plate behind the uh, colonian, and therefore we can compare right and left lung fields. So if we've got a lung lesion, we not only know where it is in the lung, from cranial to caudal, we can also work out whether it's in the right or the left lung field. Clearly the dorsal ventral view in these cases is going to give us very little information about what's going on in the lungs, but it will give us some skeletal information, maybe sufficient to tell us about eggs and things of that nature. So these are the sorts of typical three views that we're going to get. So dorsal ventral, head ends this way, we're going to see things like eggs. We're not going to see an awful lot else. Maybe a bit of gas in the stomach. Probably not a heck of a lot else. Um, some some uh, limbs and that's about it. Craniocaudal view though, 
we can compare right and left lung fields, lateral view, we can see the whole of the lung fields, we may be able to see what's going on with the viscera as well, we may get a bit of an idea of what's going on with the viscera, colonia are always a challenge because of the shell. Um, but similarly for um, uh, lizards, um, horizontal beam radiography, neatly firing out the window of course, uh, at any passers-by, I hasten to add that was an off, uh, what's it, area that was out in the back of the window, um, but nonetheless, um, firing horizontal beams um, so that we can get uh, an idea of what's going on with the viscera um, is uh, preferable, uh, again, because it makes life difficult to interpret things. If we've got a nice horizontal beam, I can see all the lung field and I can see the... Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll break a little bit early then um, so that you get um, the majority of your, um, your lunch break and be back for Georgia at, at, at half one. Um, the dorsoventral view does not give us a great deal of detail in the lungs because obviously we're looking at the lungs superimposed on the viscera underneath, um, which is going to be the heart cranially up here. The heart's usually in this area, uh, in the pectoral. Um, the liver lobes, particularly in this area, and then stomach, left side, um, and intestines caudally. And also, in a lot of lizards, uh, fat pads in the caudal area as well. We can do barium and Conray studies, um, digestive tract studies. This is a corn snake. Um, to orientate yourself with snake uh, images, the ribs always point backwards, so head end has to be this end. Um, dorsoventral um, and lateral views. Um, vertebra, ribs, um, dorsoventral view often doesn't give you huge amounts of detail because the spinal cord is, spinal column I should say, is there in the way. But it does give you a little bit of detail on this particular one. The reason we've done this, we had a, a lump on this particular corn snake, um, which um, uh, on initial fine needle aspirate suggested that it was inflammatory in nature rather than neoplastic, but we were wanting before we tried to take it out to work out how far it went. So we did a little contrast study uh, and stomach tubed it uh, with a little bit of Conray. And you can see it comes down to this point here. It's clearly being pinched at this point here. And also in the lateral view, you can see it's going over the top of the granuloma uh, in this area. And there's a little bit of a tail off as it goes into the rest of the digestive system there. So this thing is definitely not just subcutaneous. It's actually going inside um, the snake. And similarly in this one here, in this reticulated python, we filled the stomach, and here we are at the outflow of the stomach. We've suddenly hit a bit of a brick wall uh, where something is blocking it. You could palpate this um, in this particular snake. Um, it doesn't look as if it's a foreign body. Um, I wondered if it was a, a, a tumour. It actually turns out it's a granuloma. So this is the caudal end of the stomach, the proximal end of the intestines. Um, and these typically are associated um, with um, uh, abscesses that form from either spicules of bone or, or teeth from rodents that punch their way through the stomach wall. Uh, it's often, although not always, associated with feeding slightly too large a rodent prey um, to a snake. Um, and then, uh, as I say, they get a, they get a, a, a little bit of a, uh, a perforation of the caudal stomach wall and a granuloma can form and this one had obviously then uh, effectively occluded the outflow. Um, normal findings, gravidity, um, very radiodense in the case of colonia uh, as far as eggs are concerned, much less radiodense, much more leathery in nature in squamates, so snake uh, and lizard eggs, but you can see the sheer number in this chameleon lateral view dorsoventral view in this case. You can see how far up they come. They've got two oviducts in these guys. Um, liver's on the floor at the bottom here. Um, so you get an impression of these ovoid structures. Um, it is um, sometimes uh, difficult on small guys to see what's going on. Um, some normal structures. Do you know what these are in this particular little lizard? Calcium, Calcium sacs. Very good, yeah. So these, this is a day gecko. This is one of Standing's day gecko. And they actually have lymphatic calcium ducts in these areas for storing calcium. So that is a perfectly normal finding. You ready graph it the first time, go, what on earth is that? Um, this is a perfectly normal feature for this particular species. This particular species here also has um, some spiky bits at the back um, of the mouth and the underside of 
um, the cervical area, this particular snake. Um, does anybody know what that might be for? Yeah, um, I get, get what you're, you're, you're thinking of. Yes, could be disarticulation. We've got some spikes here. We've got some spikes here. Um, it's not that. This is an egg-eating snake. They have spikes at the back of the mouth. So they take the egg in and then they contract and the spikes puncture the egg to collapse it. And then they swallow it. So they don't swallow the egg all the way down whole. They take it into the back of the oropharynx and then these projections that come off. So if you're looking at it and thinking, oh, well, there's some, you know, spondylosis or some sort of um, aberrant bony structure there. That's not the case. That's normal for that particular uh, species. There's some fairly abnormal findings in this particular individual, and this is quite uh, significant. So these um, poorly defined uh, radiographs are poorly defined because there is very little, if any, bone density in this adult female iguana. You can maybe get a bit of an impression of ovoid structures um, inside the salomic cavity here. Actually the liver's all the way up here now at the moment, so there's something filling this area. And the lateral view, again, sort of scalloped edges. But if you look at the bone quality, and often with metabolic bone disease, it's recommended to look at the bone density in a distal limb and compare it with the soft tissue surrounding it. And can you clearly identify the bone in that area versus the soft tissue. Well, in this particular one, it's difficult to differentiate the bone in the antibrachium, um, uh, uh, let alone in the distal limb. And actually, you know, the, there really is very poor definition. And this particular female uh, also has a spontaneous femoral fracture over here um, and is basically just calcium depleted. So it came in comatose with a hypocalcemic uh, collapse uh, because of in an inappropriate diet, lack of UV light provision, but she still went and produced eggs. This is post-ovulatory stasis. She was in with a male, so actually she developed post-ovulatory stasis and then crashed because effectively she'd used all the calcium that she possibly had. The, the most mineralized thing in her body is what's in her digestive tract. Um, there's very little else uh, left. Um, and we can see some really serious pneumonic lesions. We're talking about colonia. Again, this view doesn't tell us anything about what's going on in the lungs. The craniochordal view shows us, well, the lung fields are, are nearly gone, particularly on the left side. And actually, we can see on the, on the lateral view that it, the fluffy densities extend the whole length of the lung fields. Now, it doesn't give you the diagnosis as to whether that's pneumonia or whether that is potentially associated with something like congestive heart failure. Um, but it certainly tells you that the entire lung field is being affected. And this animal, even if it's not showing very obvious clinical signs, is quite close um, to crashing. Similarly, occasionally you might just see a little bit of a difference on a dorsoventral view where there is a very unilateral lesion. So you can get a bit of an idea here, left and right, that actually the right side is perhaps more radiodense than the left, but it's not going to give us that information until we do a craniochordal view. And then all of a sudden we can see, yes, the right lung field has more radiodense, fluffy densities in the ventral dependent parts than the left lung field. And we can see when we look at it on the lateral, it is uh, much more caudal in nature, the head ends that end. So it's caudal in nature uh, and dependent. Um, so we've got a right caudal dependent lung field. Why is that important? Well, if I want to get to it to sample it, the best way of doing it is to drill down through the shell to sample it. Um, and so now I know where it is. I know where to position my drill site to actually get to the organism to sample it so that I get it on the right antibiosis. Similarly in snakes we can see profound pneumonia. Um, so this one here, the heart is in about here. This, this is supposed to be all the lung field. We've got that bit there, that little tiny bit there. And this snake is still apparently moving about, well not moving about much, but not, you know, gasping or anything. They often just become, they become anorexic certainly, they often become just a little less uh, keen to move around. They often position themselves with the head just up uh, because obviously they're trying to keep the fluid down the bottom end of the lungs. So they've still got some lung to breathe with. Um, often, probably not in an advanced case like that, but often if you just gently tip the head downwards, fluid will passively run out of the lungs and into the mouth and you'll see it coming out. There's no cough reflex in these guys because there's no diaphragm. So there's nothing there that they will cough it up. Um, and a similar case in this particular one here. This one 
you can actually see that there is some distortion there and the lung field starts. This is the heart. There's the lung field starting. There's the heart in this one. Trachea coming down here, lung field. This one actually has cardiomegaly. Uh, and this is a corn snake with a, with a cardiomyopathy. Now this one you could see from the outside. You could see the distension. Um, the radiograph gives us a bit of an idea. Yes, it probably is the heart, but it's not going to tell us, obviously, whether or not that is due to a pericardial abscess, whether it's a tumour, whether it's hypertrophic, whether it's dilated, what's going on. We're going to have to go to ultrasound, which we'll come to in a second. Green iguana, dorsoventral, lateral horizontal beam. Um, spot the problem. What's wrong? Yes, very good. Rectangular shape. That is a stabilo rubber, which it ate off its owner's floor. Uh, where do you think that is in relation to its digestive tract? So, head is obviously here. Knees, head, pelvis. Stomach, stomach. yeah, absolutely. That's, that's where its stomach is. So it is quite far caudal. And they actually have despite being a herbivore, they have relatively short digestive tract. They do have a kind of a multi-leaved um, uh, increased surface area to their colon, but it's actually quite a short digestive tract. Here's the liver. You can see that sort of triangle on the bottom there. Obviously lung field, air sac, digestive tract. Problem with this horizontal beam is you often get overlay um, of limbs, particularly hind limbs, which doesn't make life terribly easy to interpret. Lung fields, lung fields. Heart is up here right up the top, iguanids and agamas, it's right up the pectoral girdle, very difficult to image radiographically. But yes, that is in its stomach uh, all the way down there. Kidneys are actually in the pelvis. So again, kidneys, incredibly difficult in squamates, uh, in uh, lizards to image. Another green iguana. What do you think is going on? Same two views, head end this end, tail end that end. Yeah, okay, you're on the right lines. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's part of the story. What are we seeing here? Ascites? Yeah, we're seeing fluid. So this is the other great advantage of doing horizontal beam radiography. We get to see fluid where it's supposed to be. If we put that on its side, it would just wash over the whole thing. There's no diaphragm to keep it in the salon, in the so-called abdominal cavity. You can see that's the liver there. It's now off the floor. The liver's floating. Okay. This is the stomach. It's now, it was down there. should be down there. It's now floating up with the gravel sign. This view, we're looking at it going, well, that could be lung pneumonia. It could be all sorts of things. This view is clearly not lung. It's in here. We've lost all contrast in there. And yes, this was an impaction with perforated bowel that had resulted in a coelomitis. Um, it actually survived. Reptiles can cope with phenomenal amounts of uh, problems. This particular bearded dragon, slightly more difficult to see, but lateral view here. This view here shows you the part of the problems with um, uh, imaging animals that have got very knobbly um, skin, have got osteoderms. We can see the little pinpoint spots all over um, the body, which are little areas of increased mineralization in the in the skin. The lateral view, we're not getting it quite so much, but we can see in this area here, we've actually got um, a dorsal lung pneumonia in this particular case. This was actually a case of systemic uh, mycobacteriosis. Uh, what is also not entirely clear on this particular one, there was a little bit of joint swelling in multiple different joints on this one, um, but actually this is mycobacterial disease. It could be any other bacterial disease of that distribution, to be frank. Uh, but the owner had been feeding it um, uh, dead guppies from their tropical tank um, because that's obviously what an inland bearded dragon lives off. Um, but anyway, yes, had managed to give it mycobacterium marinum um, and then had kept the reptile at suboptimal temperatures and it developed systemic mycobacteriosis on the back of it. it took six weeks to do it, but... Um, Unfortunately, not, not curable. Right, I think what we'll do is we'll break there. We'll have an early lunch. Were there any questions on that little lot? And then um, I say those that need to see Georgia, uh, if they want to pop back for about half one, um, Georgia will be here. And then we'll aim to sort of kick off again about sort of quarter to two, ten to two, something like that after you've all 
Had a chat with Jordan. Mm -hmm. Good, okay?